It's a cold February evening at Duluth International Airport, with temperatures in the weather briefing reporting negative 12 degrees Celsius. The pilot's trip began earlier that day when he flew from Winona Municipal Airport, his home airport, to Thunder Bay, Ontario, via Duluth for a meeting before heading back home. The round trip totals approximately 630 nautical miles, well within the capabilities of both the pilot and instrument-rated CFI with over 2,100 hours of logged flight time and his aircraft, a 1969 M20 Sea Ranger. It's equipped with a Garmin 530 GPS and an STEC 30 autopilot, which includes altitude hold, heading hold, and GPS steer, among other functions. After clearing customs at Duluth International Airport, the pilot files an IFR route direct to Winona Municipal Airport and is cleared as filed. Woody, uh, four nine or fifty, you ready to go? You need a few more minutes yet. Yeah, we're just about ready to go. Woody, four nine or Victor, turn left heading two four zero, runway two seven, clear for takeoff. All right, left uh, two four zero, clear for takeoff. One and Victor, we're uh, we're gonna go. During climb-out, the pilot pitches the airplane to climb at an airspeed of 105 knots and sets his trim to hold that attitude at his current heading, approximately 195 degrees. After a few transmissions with Duluth Tower, the pilot switches to departure frequency. Good afternoon. Departure, Monday 901, 400 uh, Climbing through 4,300, 400 degrees. 49er Victor, departure, radar contact. Turn left, direct Winona, maintain 900,000. Left direct Winona up to 900,000, 49er Victor. That was the last thing I remember of the flight. And that was only about four and a half minutes after I took off. You see uh, souls and fuel remaining? I don't know how much fuel I got, but I bet I got at least one or two quarts. Traffic control. Mayday, mayday, mayday. So you had two choices to give up or fight for your life. Told him I loved him. And I put the nose of the plane down into the canyon. The Mooney's flight track shows the airplane maintains its heading and stops climbing at an altitude of 12,500 feet, considerably higher than the pilot's filed altitude of 9,000 feet. Booty 9149 or Victor, if you hear Duluth, contact Minneapolis Center 121.05 and let them know what altitude you're climbing to. 95 minutes after takeoff at 12,500 feet MSL, the Mooney's engine stops due to fuel starvation. Flight aware data stops reporting the pilot's location at 7.53 p.m. 72 nautical miles west of his intended destination at an altitude of 2,300 feet MSL. Rescue services are dispatched to the aircraft's last known location. The next thing I know is I'm waking up and I, I, I think I'm flying and I want to tell ATC I fell asleep. So I started keying the mic and trying to raise ATC. And as I'm doing this, I'm looking forward and I started to kind of get happy because my window was so clear. I was like, this is really nice. <laughs> I kind of paused. I'm like, this looks really good. And then I remember reaching forward to touch it kind of and it was gone. There's some pictures after the accident and you can see the glare shield. And there's a hand streak coming back through my condensation that was all over the, the panel. And that was from me reaching forward and pulling my hand back. And as I was doing that, then I noticed that there were some trees off to my left and that I was in kind of a field. And that's when I, I started to realize I wasn't flying anymore. I arrived out at the airport. I'm not a huge morning person. And uh, so I didn't get up early enough to have any sort of breakfast or any sort of coffee. And coffee was pretty common for me. And uh, I didn't have any that, that morning. I took off on runway 30 out of Winona and I'm in the climb and something got caught in my eye and it irritated my left eye. I do remember that. Uh, and I started rubbing it and I was trying to, trying to get it out and figure out what it was. And then I thought to myself, oh, this could be carbon monoxide because it's the winter and I'm running the heat on full. So I turned the heat off 
and to see if it would clear up. And I did get whatever it was out of my eye and got my eye clear. But then I thought that has nothing to do with carbon monoxide. Um, it was just something's caught in my eye and it was getting really cold. So I turned the heat back on and continued on. And that was the last time I thought about carbon monoxide the entire day. I always have a pulse oximeter with me. And if I'm cruising at 5,500 feet or 17.5, I'm always checking it and seeing where I'm at. So I have a good idea and a good baseline of where I'm supposed to be. On this particular flight, I was at 10,000 feet. I put it on. I don't remember the reading, but I remember the reading was several points higher than normal. And it was in the morning and it was beautiful and I had several points higher than normal and I thought, this is going great. I'm doing really well. And I took it off and that was the last time I used it. Um, but it was also another little tidbit on what was happening to me. So the pulse oximetry works on color of the blood and the, the carbon monoxide colors the blood in the way that it increases your O2 saturation on a pulse oximeter. So I thought I was doing better, but really I was seeing that I was being poisoned by carbon monoxide and I, was, I had much, much lower O2 sats. So for two and a half hours, I had the heating system on full. 10 to 15 minutes before I landed, I started to get a slight headache and I immediately thought about the coffee I didn't have. And I just assumed I, I was having a caffeine headache, which was at that time in my life was really common if I cut out ca caffeine. I was that kind of addicted to it. So it didn't, it didn't set off any alarm bells at all. I taxied into the ramp and I called the Canadian Customs because that was the procedure. I was to call them on the phone and let them know what time I landed. And the Customs agent asked and I told him I landed at 9.15 just a few minutes ago. And he was kind of confused and there was some fumbling around. And he then gave me a clearance code and I wrote it down. And uh, I think he said, have a nice day or, or something to that, that I like. And I got out of the airplane, secured it, I plugged it in, and I sprinted into the FBO building. And when I got in there, I found out that Thunder Bay in the wintertime was on Eastern time zone, not Central time zone. And I had no idea, Chicago Central time zone, that's far east compared to Thunder Bay. I immediately thought about my conversation with the customs agent, and that's why he was confused. It was really 10.15, it wasn't 9.15. And I, I arrived outside of my plus or minus 30 minute window by 45 minutes. I had this anxiety feeling. I thought I was in trouble. I thought that maybe the customs would come breaking in and I would, I would get locked up or who knows. I, d I had no idea. This anxiety feeling I had, I'd never experienced before. Uh, I've never experienced since, but I attributed it to anxiety. And so I thought that um, the way I was feeling was because of what happened with customs. And I didn't think there was any other influence on it. So up until this point, I had the higher pulse ox and I had the slight headache, and I had anxiety, which isn't normal for me. So then I went and got lunch, I got some coffee, and I, my headache started to go away, started to feel a little bit better. Uh, and I went back to them after lunch and had the meeting with them, and, and everything went, went well with the meeting. Uh, but my headache would come and go. It would, it would be kind of strong, but then it would get, go away, and it would kind of come back, and it would go away. Thunder Bay to Duluth the entire flight, I didn't have any physical symptoms. I felt good. It was just a nice ending to the day. So I landed Duluth and I felt great. I taxi up, I shut the plane down. And the second I stood up on the wing outside of the airplane, so I opened the door and I stand up and I got a splitting headache. It was almost as if someone hit me in the face and it, it was that abrupt and quick. And what I was attributing it to was my, my daughter was sick that week leading up to this. And I assumed I was getting whatever she had. Um, and that was how I justified it this time. And the other thing that was interesting was that symptom didn't come in the airplane. It came when I got out of the airplane. And so I never connected the way I was feeling with the airplane itself. I go and finish the customs. So I ran out, jumped on the plane, got it started. And as I was idling, then I got my iPad and I filed my IFR flight plan back to Winona. As I was waiting for that to be in the system because the tower wouldn't know I have an IFR flight plan, I organized the cockpit. I put hat and gloves on the seat next to me. I put my headlamp on that I always wore at night. I put my headsets on, obviously. Uh, I had the flashlight next to me. Once I got uh, noticed that it was in the system, then I called the ground and got my clearance. 
Yeah, I'm with the 400 Victor, we're over here at the FBO with uh, information Sierra. We're ready to copy our FR to 109. Mooney 49 Victor, clear the Winona Airport as filed, maintain 6,000, expect 9,000, one zero minutes after departure. Departure frequency 125.45, squawk 4250. Cleared the uh, Winona as filed, 6,000, expect 9,000, one zero minutes, uh, 12545, departure, and 4250, Mooney 49 Victor, are you back correct? By the time I got my clearance, uh, I had already been sitting in the cockpit with the heat full on, trying to stay warm for between 10 and 20 minutes. At this point, I knew I didn't feel well, but I was just an hour from home, and so I just wanted to get home and not feel well there. Uh, on the taxi out, there was a moment where I had that anxiety feeling come back, and it hit me really hard. Uh, but it was only 15 to 20 seconds long, and once that went away, the headache went away. I mean, as quick as, quick as I explained it, it just went from headache to all of a sudden I feel fine and I got to the run-up area, and I don't remember if I was repeating the flow or if I did the flow and was repeating the checklist, but either way, I was kind of locked into some sort of a check it and then go through it again and then go through it again, check it, go through it again, check it, go through it again, check it, go through it again. And I sat at the run-up area so long that the tower had called me and asked if I was ready to take off. I didn't ask for takeoff. Woody, uh, four or nine or Vicky, you ready to go? You need a few more minutes yet. Yeah, we're just about ready to go. I don't even remember saying that. This is from the ATC feeds. But then uh, about 45 seconds later, the tower just clears me for takeoff. And I didn't ask. I just all of a sudden was like, okay, how am I going to go now? <laughs> I really wasn't driving the bus at this point. I didn't know what was going on. So the airplane would, was full power, full rich mixture. I had it trimmed for a climb of, a, of at about 120 miles an hour or 105 knots was my trimmed climb speed. And the STEC 30 autopilot had altitude hold, but that was it. Once you get to altitude, you hit altitude hold. It tells you to retrim it if it needs to, and then it maintains altitude. So it was just tracking a heading and climbing uh, with the trimmed airspeed that I had set. Fortunately, I had full rich mixture. Uh, a lot of times I would lean. At, by the time I was at uh, 3,000, 4,000 feet, I'd start to lean for the climb. And fortunately, I didn't in this case because I would have went higher for longer. And uh, more than likely, that would have been fatal for sure. When I was maybe 100 or 200 feet up, I went to put the landing gear up. And when I put the landing gear up, that butterfly's feeling came back really intense again and it lasted only 15 or 20 seconds and then it went away. And I had no idea what that was. Um, they told me that they cleared me to turn left to heading 240 and up to 6,000 feet. So I thought I was doing that. The flight track shows that I turned further than 240. I think what it was is I never set the DG right. So even though I ran through the checklist multiple times, I didn't set the DG correctly. And then they gave me the handoff to departure. Moody 9149 Victor, contact departure 125.45. Five, one on Richter. I really slurred the read back of the frequency and I didn't hit flip flop. And I called departure, but it was the tower and they told me to flip it. And then it took quite a while for me to flip it and talk to departure. And departure then cleared me direct to Winona up to 9,000 feet. The next thing I know after I get my direct to clearance, um, I enter it in the 530 and I didn't hit my GPS steer button. That whole time I remember thinking something was really amiss, something was wrong. And I had my thumb hovering over uh, the autopilot disconnect and thinking I gotta hit this, I gotta tell them I have to come back and land. Um, that was kind of my last thoughts. Now if I did that, if I disconnected the autopilot, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so fortunately I lost consciousness. <laughs> Without any inputs from the pilot, the aircraft miraculously crashed into a field in such a way that it was survivable. It isn't often we get to hear from a pilot who has experienced carbon monoxide poisoning in flight. This is partly due to the low number of occurrences in general aviation, and this is partly due to the fatal nature of CO-related accidents.
According to the NTSB, 77% of aviation accidents involving carbon monoxide poisoning are fatal. But these accidents are worth looking at because they are so preventable. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas, and due to the cognitive effects CO has on the brain, without a detector in the cockpit, a pilot and their passengers have little chance of becoming aware of a leak. A functioning carbon monoxide detector in the cockpit is the only way to know if CO is present. For increased safety and maximum effectiveness, the FAA recommends the use of an electrochemical sensor-based CO detector placed on or near the instrument panel with an alarm threshold of 35 parts per million or lower. It's really important that people have at least two um, because these, these digital devices, we don't really know if they're working right or if they fail. What are they going to do when they fail? And so it's really good to have two and make sure they're both uh, telling similar information. Um, now, if you have two detectors and one's saying 10 parts per million and the other one's saying five, it doesn't really matter. It just matters that we know we're getting CO. Well, what I found out after was CO doesn't go away quickly. It goes down slowly. And so the morning flight, it would have built up. Now it had a break during the day where it came down, but it certainly wasn't to zero yet. And then the next flight, it would have built up again before the, the, the third flight. When they talk about symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, they talk about the physiological, I'm gonna get a headache, I'm gonna get dizzy, et cetera. And they, the way they build it in their symptom chart is a linear progression. And if you've got a partial headache now, you're clearly gonna have a much worse headache later. Not it'll go away and it'll come back and it'll go away. That's one thing, but the other thing that I haven't seen talked about is that as you're getting those symptoms, your cognitive ability is going down. And so by the time you have the strong headache, to make the connection on why you're not as smart as you were before it all started. So that's the problem. The M20C has a four into one muffler and a single exhaust pipe. And the muffler right in the center uh, developed a crack right, right over on the top side and that's underneath the heater shroud. So the heat of the airplane comes in, goes around that, gets heated up by the hot exhaust, and then goes into the cabin. So it was leaking hot exhaust directly into the heating system. The flight before this day of flights, I took my wife and kids down to Rushford, Minnesota to get some ice cream. Weird thing to do in January in Minnesota, but we did it. And uh, when we were leaving, I was starting up down there and my airplane backfired and my wife was kind of like, what was that? And so that was rare, but I said, oh, don't worry about it. And it, the, after my accident, the FAA asked me, have you had any backfires recently? So that could have caused the crack or made it worse or it didn't help, that's for sure. I hate to say it, but there was almost like an innocence to flying before this. Before this, I didn't really, I didn't know anyone who perished in an airplane crash. I didn't know really that many people have crashed. And then now through my, my telling the story, I've made a lot of friends and I know lots of people that have crashed <laughs> and I know people that have perished in crashes. And so it's taken an innocence kind of away from flying. Flying used to be, man, I'm, I used to fly at night all the time and I loved it. And now I fully expect my engine to quit every time <laughs> I go flying. So. It's, it's changed, it's, it's not as relaxing to fly, but I still love it. Um, but I'm always looking for a place to land. I'm always worrying about what's gonna break next. Every flight has a multitude of factors to consider. Some are out of our control and others are not. Fortunately, carbon monoxide poisoning is one of those controllable factors, one we can all work toward preventing in our own cockpit and eventually bring the occurrence rate of CO poisoning down to zero.